Okay. Welcome to Identifying and Reporting Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven with New York IMAP Invasives. Our presenters today will be Tom Algeyer, Invasive Species Coordinator with the New York State Department of Ag and Markets, and Michael Giambalvo, who's Assistant Horticultural Inspector also with Ag and Markets. From the New York Natural Heritage Program, Jennifer Dean, Invasive Species Biologist, and Mitchell O'Neill, End User Support Specialist, will be presenting. And I am Meg Wilkinson, Invasive Species Database Program Coordinator with Heritage. All right, our goal today is to train volunteers across the state to identify and report spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven to IMAP. This will be to complement work being conducted by state agency staff. We'll have this short welcome. Then Tom Algeyer will cover spotted lanternfly overview and identification, and Michael Giambalvo will cover tree of heaven identification. Then Jennifer Dean and Mitchell O'Neill will cover the IMAP Invasive section. Then we'll loop back to me for a couple of wrap-up slides. And then we will shift gears for questions. First, I want to pause and just acknowledge the collaborative nature of invasive species work across the state. New York is fortunate to have many individuals, agencies, and organizations working on invasive species issues. These are volunteers, citizen scientists, natural resource professionals. And in the IMAP world, they contribute data to IMAP, they help review data submitted, and they utilize IMAP data in many ways. Across the state, the invasive species work is all taxa. So invasive plants such as giant hogweed and water chestnut and invasive animals, uh, including insects such as HWA. Today, for this project, we are focusing on this webinar on tree of heaven and spotted lanternfly. This specific project is collaborative statewide effort involving partners across the state and you. The Tree of Heaven records will be reviewed by what we informally call our IMAP confirmer network, which includes volunteers and professionals across the state. The spotted lanternfly data will all be reviewed by New York State agency staff. As you contribute data, please, please, please include photos. It will help tremendously in the review process. So the goal of this project is to help protect our incredible state. And by the end of the webinar, we hope that you can check off the six check boxes there and that you're comfortable identifying spotted lanternfly, tree of heaven, that you're comfortable using your IMAP account, that you've set up a square, that you have set up the IMAP mobile app, and that you're ready to go outside and survey. Now we'll look at the poll results and um, Look at that, I'm under time. <laughs> we'll look at the poll results, and um, we will do a similar poll at the end. So you'll be absorbing information for the next hour, and we hope um, that you feel that you are um, successful at those check boxes by the end of the webinar today. Okay, poll results. I see email, hi three email categories, all high, and other pretty high. And then I have to scroll down to see the other results. How comfortable, a little, some, moderate, very, 
I don't know what the no A means. Does anyone? Not answered. Not answered. Oh, thank you. And then how familiar. Uh, cool. All right. Well, that's a great starting point. And as I said, there'll be a similar poll question at the end. All right, then I have just three notes uh, to cover. Next slide, Mitchell. Okay, uh, the first is we will be using the chat box. So as I mentioned, that's on the right-hand side of your screen and you can type into the box and John Marino will be manning the chat box. He will answer some questions directly in the chat box and other questions he will gather and uh, bring to the presenters uh, as time allows. Second, if you are taking this webinar for continuing ed education credits, please watch for the post-webinar email. There will be a link in there. There is a form to complete for each of those three different continuing education credits. And a heads up for anyone doing it for the New York Certified Pesticide Applicators, that form includes a short quiz. So, <laughs> um, heads up on that. Also, I want to let people know this is the first of a four-part webinar series. Each of those uh, webinars will be similar. Um, we will change the biology a little bit for the season, and then also the November 17th one will give some wrap-up information. Okay, next slide. Now it is my honor to pass the microphone to Tom Algeyer. Good morning, everyone. Tom Algeyer from New York State and Agriculture Markets. Um, I'm sure you, most of you have heard or, or heard a lot about spotted lanternfly already, but we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit deeper here. Uh, next slide, please. So the New York Department of Agriculture and Markets is the lead state agency in responding to spotted lanternfly at this time. Um, so just letting you know that. Uh, a lot of other agencies, including some of our federal partners at the USDA, um, are also involved. But uh, currently, New York Ag and Markets is the, uh, the lead agency. Next slide. So, spotted lanternfly, Zelecutata, is a spider is a plant hopper, very similar to an aphid. Uh, they were first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014. Uh, they were originating from China and Southeast Asia, primarily Vietnam. Uh, they use their mouth parts uh, to, to uh, remove sap from plants. They're not so much uh, sucking it, but they allow the plant pressure to push the sap through their bodies. It kind of filters through. They're more filter feeders than sap sucking. Uh, they feed on approximately seven different host plants here in the United States, Tree of Heaven being one of their favorites, but they also feed on some very important other crops, such as grapes, apples, hops, maples, walnuts, and, and many others. Next slide, please. Some of their impacts be uh, stressful feeding. When their, their feeding can be stressful to plants, causing them to not develop or to abort fruit or to change the flavor of the fruit. Um, also makes them vulnerable to disease and attacks once the plants are stressed. Other invasive, other predators and other plant pests can also attack those stressed plants. Uh, they produce the, Sticky, sugary, rich honeydew is an excrement. Um, that excrement will rain down as if it's raining on a bright sunny day um, when they're in mass. As you can see here in the, the photo on the upper right, they like to congregate in, 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 in masses. They do this as adults and also as in the, the nymph stages. So while they're uh, feeding, the honeydew is raining down on the bottom left corner and the left side, you can see the, the top two shelves, uh, sorry, steps are coated in honeydew that has since uh, produced a bloom of, of sooty mold. So that sugary rich excrement uh, for this, uh, sooty mold to grow on. 
Um, it'll block photosynthesis on leaves, as you can see here in this grape photo, grape leaf in the bottom photo. Um, a lot of it is kind of kind of coating the ground on this post on the right hand side. So you can see how that could be a you know a, a social nuisance for your house, and your car, or for anything outside underneath where they're feeding, and also uh, a stress for the plants. A little bit more about their impacts. Um, vineyard losses, you know, New York ranks third in, in nationwide grape production, um, only coming in uh, third between Pennsylvania and of course, California. Uh, it's definitely a threat to our vineyards in Pennsylvania. We have already begun to see losses, not just losses of fruit, but losses of vines. There's a lot of things that feed on grapes. There's not a lot of things that kill grapes. Uh, orchard impacts, uh, apple production in New York State is only the second, only to Washington State. Yet, yeah, very, very, very uh, important crop to our New York farmers and to our New York citizens. Uh, hops production will be can also be impacted. It's another one of their favorite host plants. Uh, expanding New York hop growing production, a lot of local vineyards. Uh, sorry, a lot of local breweries use New York hops in their brewing. So this is also threatened. There are also many environmental impacts to forests and forest products, whether it be maple syrup or logging, uh, or, or just enjoying a, you know, the forest environment in a park. Uh, there are a lot of other impacts other than agricultural for spotted lanternfly. And again, you can hear, see here an adult landing on a leaf, and it's co just covered with you know, the, the glossy, shiny part is the honeydew. And you can see the the black sooty mold starting to bloom on the from the uh, honeydew. Next row, please. Currently, the the known range of spotted lanternfly is black and blue. Some uh, purple kind of little dots outliers there. Those were primarily dead insects that were found um, during survey. But the known populations are limited to these areas in blue. Um, you could see here, there's an area in central New York, which is Ithaca. Um, it's not the entire county. It's a very, very small location within the city of Ithaca. Um, also, you can see that there are other counties in New York and we're kind of sandwiched in between New Jersey and, and the known locations in Connecticut. So it, it's not quite as widespread. It's not in the entire blue area. Uh, most of these counties are only partially known to have partial infestations, but the blue area is where it's currently known to be. And we're worried about the rest of New York. Slide, please. So the life cycle, right now, I'm gonna start with the eggs because that's the life stage that we're in now. So the eggs are the only part that overwinters. Um, the egg masses can be covered or uncovered. Uh, you can see the uncovered ones here. They look almost like sesame seeds glued to a tree. And then there's like a grayish putty, although the color does change and the texture does change over time, um, but mostly the, the egg masses, the a larger percentage of them are covered, but there is a, a, a percentage that are uncovered. So the egg masses can look either way. Um, so the eggs are laid in the fall uh, up until the first heavy hard freeze when the adult insects will die off. But uh, in the spring, um, at least around here, um, we're finding nymphs emerge in April. So anywhere from April to early May, they'll start to emerge. And they're very, very tiny. Um, this photo makes it look, you know, large like your finger, but what it's perched on is actually a spruce needle. So if you can picture the needles on a spruce tree, that's perched atop the tip of a spruce needle. So they're very tiny, almost the size of a tick. And, and at that life stage, the first instar, they're often confused as ticks, but they're also hard to find because they're so tiny and they disperse and they're, and they're kind of general feeders at that point. Um, they'll molt three times and they'll remain this color black with the white dots. The fourth time they molt, they'll produce, they'll start getting these red spots on their back. They're a lot more visible at that stage. Um, and they're about the size of a dime, a little bit smaller than a dime at that point. Um, and they'll also congregate. So they're, they're much more visible at that life stage. And then eventually starting in July, they'll, they'll metamorphosize one more time. They'll shed that exoskeleton and emerges in a fully emerged as a fully mature adult with wings and um, they'll begin to mating process and feeding. 
as adults and then ready right into the the egg stage again in the fall so please just another infographic of what we're stages uh you can see now that we're you know you can see egg egg masses pretty much all year uh you may even find some uh empty egg masses that are already hatched during august and july but primarily through september through june you'll find egg masses which is most of the year uh, they're a little bit harder to spot than the adults or even the nymphs. They're not as showy and colorful and they don't move around, but it's uh, currently that's what we're going to focus on. The first through, through third instars are these black and white ones that I've talked about previously on the left side. They're relatively pretty small. Each time they, they shed their exoskeleton, they go from first instar to second to third. Um, they get a little bit larger until they get this, to the fourth instar that I mentioned previously. Uh, fourth in star can be found during the summer months, July, August, to September, and then they'll emerge um, as a, and they'll exist up until the first frost. Um, a light frost won't kill them; they just kind of become lethargic and don't move around very much. Um, but they'll be killed off by the first heavy frosts. Next slide, please. Here you can see egg mass on um, true. Uh, Tree of Heaven has this kind of cantaloupe-looking skin. It looks very much like the uh, the outer skin of a cantaloupe. Um, if you look real quick, it's it's hard to see, and the lighting in this photo is very bright and clear on a on a cloudy, overcast day or under the canopy of a you know a forest. It would be very difficult to see that egg mass in the center. If you can click the sl slide one more time, there it is, highlighted in the center. Um, but it, it blends in very, very easily with the uh, with the bark. And you can see that this is starting to dry out. It's it's a little bit darker color. It's got some some stippling to it, some some texture that the first uh, first laid fresh laid eggs are, are more smooth. So they definitely do change in texture. Next slide, please. Uh, egg mass. Um, you can see it on the, the photo on the right. There's two egg masses. The one is almost white, and then the other one is more gray. Uh, the whiter, almost white one is off white one there is very freshly laid, and the other one is just starting to dry out. Um, on the left side, you can see that this is a piece of bark that was peeled off a tree. I believe it was a, uh, uh, it was either a, a white oak or a shag bark hickory. I can't remember what they said. Um, but so the bark pieces were pulled off the tree, but you could see that the, the egg mass was on the back side of the bark um i'll get into that a little bit more later um so it's not always on a flat exposed surface they kind of tuck themselves in sometimes and they, and they seek out protected areas Next slide Here, there's a wound that, that occurred to the tree and there may be a branch broke off or or maybe something hit it at some point and it's starting to callus over and the uh the bark is starting to grow over the tree and tucked in there on the left side, you can see that little shadow, that little little bit of glossiness. That's the egg mass. And the close up on the right, you can see that the egg mass is is well tucked underneath that bark um, in a pr protected area. So if you were standing, you know, four or five feet away from that tree, and you were looking straight at it, you wouldn't even see that egg mass unless you walked all the way around the tree. So it's important to you know to, to not just look from one side. You know, you need the 360 degree view to really do a thorough uh, survey. Next slide. Thing that our horticulture inspectors have been using are flashlights. You can see it's a bright sunny day, blue sky, clouds in the sky, but here's a white pine branch um, and you can barely see the egg masses here on the left and uh, to the bottom left corner of the, on the photo on the right here. Um, but those are egg masses for spotted lanternfly that were found here in New York in the Orangeburg area. Um, but what they've been doing is bringing flashlights, high powered flashlights that have a focusable beam and you can shine it up into the tree canopy and, and really light up the underside of those branches, which is where you'd more likely find the egg masses. Um, so, even though it's a bright sunny day, you think I can see pretty well, you know, maybe your eyes are younger than mine, but, um, even some of our younger. Younger staff uh, have a hard time seeing these in, in daylight uh, without a flashlight to, to illuminate some of these areas. And again, this is under a white pine. You can see some of the canopy above, above it there, and, and they do produce a lot of shade. Um, 
it's just another tool to have in your uh, in your pocket when you go out and survey. Next slide. Here's a spotted lanternfly laying eggs. Uh, you can see on the left side she's already covered uh, this egg mass here. It looks a little bit of, like putty again with the the cantaloupe-like bark here uh, on a tree of heaven, and then some uncovered eggs on the right. And my guess is that she probably got disturbed by the photographer and then she was walking off uh, before she had a chance to finish laying these eggs. But the egg masses are, are usually uh, a little bit larger than that. A few more rows, but again, they look almost like seeds to, glued to the side of the tree. They don't always look like this muddy um, splotch here on the left. So they, they, they can look either way, but they, either way, they, they still blend in with this camouflaging uh, bark. And it's not just the camouflaging on the uh, tree of heaven uh, or, or Atlantis, but many tree barks have that similar texture and color where they can very easily blend in. Next slide. Uh, here's a close up in the center. You can see that the, uh, the coloring on this covered egg mass is very much different. Uh, it's very dried and cracked uh, and, and kind of flaky. And then a few strip, you know, a few strips of loose eggs here on the left, uh, where she kind of got lazy and, and missed her mark. She only covered some of the eggs. Uh, again, you know, I'm stressing that they can be covered or uncovered. That's really what the point of the left side photos are. On the right side, uh, they'll, because they'll lay out eggs on any flat surface, anything that's not moving, exposed to the environment, or, or is fair game for them to lay eggs on. But they do have a tendency to, to sheltered areas. So there's a an old rim with an old rubber tire attached to it, and they've laid multiple egg masses. They have a tendency to do that as well. They'll lay eggs in clusters. Once one egg mass is laid, the others will lay eggs in that same area. But um, this sheltered area underneath this rim, uh, again, rusty metal, they, they like for whatever, I don't know if it's a texture, but they, they do have a tendency to lay eggs on rusty metal. Um, so this rim could be on a, a spare tire on a trailer. It could be, uh, you know, an active tire on a trailer. And it could easily be moved from one location to another location. That's one of our concerns. Uh, but in these protected areas, it's not just the outside of the tire. This would have been the inside of the rim uh, where these were a little bit more protected. Uh, so, and, you know, at first glance, you think, oh, it's just, just rust or leftover paint. Uh, they blend in really well, not just with the bark, on the trees, but I'm with many surfaces. It's a little easier to spot here on the black rubber, but the ones that are on the white stripe, you know, again, it looks just like a splotch of mud. It's very, very um, difficult to, to survey for. Next slide. You have about five minutes, just to let you know. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, here you can see more rusty metal. This is an old uh, barrel or an old drum, and the egg masses are laid underneath the lip. Uh, that reinforcing lip that, that's built into the drum, and then they've congregated in the, on the bottom here because they ran out of space on the lip, so they kind of spread out. Uh, but under the lip there is uh, there are several more egg masses. On the right is another uh, example of uh, two egg masses, one covered, one uncovered. If you look at the center um, egg on the on the upper photo, on the upper egg mass on the right photo, you see that little slit in it there. Uh, right there where the cursor is kind of circling. That's an egg that is already hatched. Um, so it, it, you know, you might not see current year egg masses. Uh, you might see older egg masses. So those little slits there mean that the eggs have already hatched. So they may be eggs from last year or, or ones that have already hatched out in the current year. Next slide. Again, check underneath things. Uh, there's the back of a tractor trailer. There's nothing on the on the visible exposed surfaces. But if you kind of poke your head underneath, you can find all these egg masses. Again, rusty metal. Um, this right side photo, the bottom right corner here in the grill, you see just a little outline. It's actually an ad adult, a dead adult that was in that screen. But they can tuck themselves into, you know, Little hollows and little little areas. Um, so you know, be mindful of that. That uh, they're not always going to be on the surface. They can be tucked into places. So, next slide. Here's some rusty metal railroad track again on on the underside of the railroad track. There's a an egg mass being laid by a female. It's very light and colored. 
compared to the others that are in the photo, and you can see that there's quite variation in color. There's about three different colors. There's a, a light tan, there's a dark gray, and then almost off white, um, depending on the color and, and the age of the egg mass. On the right is something that scares us a great deal, a very easily portable camp chair. So these are one of those folding camp chairs you'd buy at a, a you know, a garden shop or a big box store. You know, you leave that in your backyard and you're going to a concert or you're going to your friend's house, you're going camping, you pick up that chair, throw it in your car, you go camping, and then you accidentally spread spotted lanternfly. So these egg masses are laid all over this chair. Um, so it's not always natural objects. It's not always rusty metal objects. It's pretty much any flat object. But this is the sort of thing that we, we really scares us because it's very portable. Next slide. So the take home messages are, uh, we're currently looking for egg masses. As you can tell, I, I focused a lot, on, a lot on the egg masses while I was speaking. Um, flat protected areas are more common to find the eggs, but they can be found on, on any flat surface. Um, they do have a tendency to seek out rusty metal for whatever reason. And also keep in mind, negative survey is good. Um, so if you look and do not find, that's great. Uh, you know, and record that data in IMAP because neg negative data is just as helpful as positive data. Um, not present it, it, data collected in IMAP is, is very useful to us. So we know it's been surveyed and it's not likely to be in those locations. But we can concentrate on areas that have not been surveyed. So just because you don't find it, don't, don't think that, oh, we don't, they don't need that information. Just think you know, negative is good. So next slide. At this point, I turn it back okay. over to Meg. Okay, great, Tom. Actually, if you wouldn't mind, we have had a lot of very excellent questions, and so I have four questions queued up. If you wouldn't mind, um, the Not at all. first yeah. excellent. The first one uh, asked several times: Is can you remind us um, the size of the egg masses that people are likely to find again? Sure. The egg masses. Um, actually, this photo in the in the upper right in the center there. You can see somebody's thumbnail. So they're about this, the width of a thumbnail, approximately uh, half to three quarters of an inch long, uh, wide rather, and they're about um, an inch, inch and a half long. But there is variability in size, as you can see. You know, the, the top one egg mass here is a, a little bit shorter than this kind of odd shaped one on the bottom, but approximately a half inch by inch and a half. So about about this width of your thumbnail, and maybe a little bit longer. Perfect. Excellent. And next one uh, has come up several times. Um, how far up a tree are you likely to find egg masses? Uh, they they can be found anywhere from the the can you know logs on the canopy floor or material laying on the on the forest floor up until the tree canopy. So they, they can be found anywhere. They do have a tendency to lay higher up in the canopy, but that could be because they're sh seeking sheltered locations, and that's where the branches are. Um, but they can be found anywhere in, you know, in the height in the canopy. Excellent. And then another one that has uh, definitely come up many times is, are there any other species of insects that have egg masses similar to SLF that people may encounter? Uh, gypsy moths, are, and there's also some, some spider uh, egg masses that look similar. Gypsy moth egg masses will um, have more of a paper mache, almost like a, a a cardboard kind of covering that's where it's starting to fray. Um, but because there is a lot of variation, we'd rather, um, you know, get the photos and it not be spotted lantern fly. Then someone say, oh, that, that's not really spotted lantern fly. It's too dark or too light. Um, but there are, there are some things, especially gypsy moths that look pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then another question has come up and um, I know we, we may discuss this later on in the year, but um, people are wondering about control. If they happen to encounter these egg masses, what would you recommend at this time? At this time, uh, because we're trying to find out where it is in New York State and, and trying to assess the uh, the extent of the infestation and, and find out where it's spreading and how it's spreading, uh, the best thing to do would be to document the the presence of it uh, and and leave the egg masses in place so that we can come if if confirm that it is spotted lanternfly and that we can move on from there. So it would be best to not do any sort of, you know, scraping or anything like that at this time. Um, you know, document it, submit the, the find, and then we'll follow up with our staff and, and confirm the presence 
and then and then we'll, we'll make our plans from there. Great, perfect. And then actually, if I'm just going to try to squeeze one more question here, because um, I think it's a good one. Are Igmas uh, more likely to, to be found where there are Alanthus or Tree of Heaven trees, um, such as a, a long road corridors, railroad, et cetera? They, they can be really be found anywhere. Um, the, the adults and the nymph stages do prefer um, Alanthus, but it's not their only host. Uh, the, the anecdotal evidence from, from state parks in some of their locations are that they're finding more in maple trees uh, than in Alanthus trees. So they really, there is no preference and that's just a very small data set and it's just kind of anecdotal. It's not a full research study, but um, they don't necessarily have to be associated with Tree of Heaven. They can be found, the egg masses, like I said, you know, the camp chair, the railroad track, anything that's not moving, that's outside, that, that has a flat surface. Um, is fair game. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Well, I think that's all for the questions for now. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, feel free to continue entering them. I am um, adding them all to a list in case we haven't addressed them yet. Um, but that's all for the questions for now. And I believe at this point, I will turn it over to Michael Giambalvo to discuss Tree of Heaven. Hi, everyone. Tree of Heaven, also known by its scientific name, Alanthus altissima, is a very widespread invasive species in New York and a lot of the eastern United States. There's new interest in mapping its occurrence because of its primary and preferred host um, being for the spotted lanternfly. And just, but just to mention, um, SLF doesn't need Tree of Heaven to survive, it just prefers to feed on it. Next slide, please. So a little history on how Tree of Heaven came to the Americas that might help you remember it. Not unlike other invasive species, it was first brought here by a gardener. Um, so it's been here a long time. You can see all the places in New York on that map where IMAP has confirmed its presence, but that doesn't mean that it's not in the areas without the red squares. It just means it hasn't been confirmed in those areas. It was also brought here to be used as a host species for um, silk moth that I don't think panned out. Uh, it was planted in the west of the continent, but the dry environment doesn't really allow it to become invasive there. And it's also planted in urban areas, which is how it became the subject of a novel based in Brooklyn. And there you could see a little drawing of Tree of Heaven growing out of one of its favorite places, a crack in a sidewalk next to a building. Next slide. Tree of Heaven's native range is similar to SLF's, um, Central China, South Asia. It likes poor soils, industrial areas, roadsides, like where I took these photos, and uh, generally where human disturbance has occurred. It can actually break through concrete, um, including the foundations of buildings, and can be pretty hard to get rid of once it's growing there. Next slide. Tree of Heaven's a fairly large tree. It could reach heights of 80 feet. Um, most of the tree in the background of that top photo are tree of is tree of heaven and then the smaller clumps in the front are also tree of heaven that are shooting up from the roots of the larger trees the bottom photo is just a young sapling but that young sapling as small as it may be can quickly grow into a large tree next slide tree of heaven has an alternate leaf arrangement if you look in the upper right hand corner of this slide, you can see the difference between alternate opposite and world leaves. So it would be the one on the left in that upper right hand picture. So they're alternate, which means rather than opposing directly across from each other on the twig. Um, so that's just one identifying characteristic. Next slide. 
Tree of Heaven has pinnately compound leaves. You could also see the difference between in the upper right hand corner again. The leaves can be one to four feet long, and that larger size that they grow to can also differentiate them from their lookalikes that are often smaller. It's one leaf made up of many smaller leaflets. Next slide. The leaflet shape is fairly unique. It has smooth edges and then one or two small lobes on either side at the base of each leaflet. These lobes are even more unique to Tree of Heaven because of the glands present on them, which is that little dot within that red circle on the lobe. You can see it's on the tip of the lobe there. And these glands actually emit a foul odor, odor, especially when they're crushed. So that's a good way to identify Tree of Heaven when the leaves are on it. Next slide. The seeds of Tree of Heaven can be showy when they turn from green to the yellow pink color. This makes spotting Tree of Heaven more easy, even from a, dif even from a distance. Uh, the seed eventually turns brown, like in that top picture, but will persist on the tree into the winter before eventually dropping. And this great number of seeds that Tree of Heaven produces is another reason why it's so invasive. Next slide. The soft pith is another dead giveaway that the tree you're looking at is Tree of Heaven. This is especially helpful in wintertime like right now, you have to cut or break open a twig or small branch to reveal the soft pith. And in warmer months, the pith has a, another unique smell reminiscent of burnt peanut butter. This smell is not always strongly detectable in winter, but that soft pith should still be there. Next slide. The bark can be helpful for winter ID as well. It's pretty smooth, so it's not going to be flaky or deeply furrowed, but has a light, shallow furrowing. And the comparison, like Tom mentioned earlier, to cantaloupe skin has always helped me remember the look of this bark. Next slide. The twig and leaf scar is the most identifying characteristic of Tree of Heaven in the wintertime. And this would be the feature that you would want to photograph clearly when submitting observations of it to IMAP before the trees leaf out. In the middle there, I have a picture of Tree of Heaven's twig and leaf scar. And on the right, I have comparisons of some of its lookalike twigs. So walnut has a similar but smaller leaf scar and a very different terminal bud on the end. Sumac is different because of its bud uh, being directly in the center of its leaf scars rather than directly above the leaf scar like in Tree of Heaven. And then horse chestnut has a similar leaf scar but a very different large red terminal bud. Next slide. Tree of Heaven's number one lookalike is sumac, which will grow right beside it in the same disturbed poor soils. In the picture on the right in the foreground, there is sumac, and then high above it in the background is Tree of Heaven, which usually grows much taller. Both have compound pinnate leaves, but Tree of Heaven's can grow much longer and larger with more leaflets. Sumac is different in that it has a red fruit and flower spike atop its branches, and these can even persist into the winter and the next growing season. Next slide. Another lookalike, because of the pinnately compound leaf and twig leaf scar, is walnut. Spud lanternfly will feed on black walnut as well, usually in one of its earlier life stages, and it'll feed on more immature, smaller walnut saplings that we've seen. 
the fruit or nut of this tree is a clear indicator that it wouldn't be tree of heaven. Those are the green balls. They, they'll turn to brown balls as they age and uh, the holes when broken will smell like citrus and contain tannins that can stain your skin and clothes. Next slide. Some would say that ash is another lookalike because of its pinnately compound leaf. But as you can see from these pictures, the tree of heaven leaf can get many more leaflets and a longer leaf, which distinguishes it from ash. Next slide. So the take home message from this portion of the webinar would be to check your trees for SLF, signs of SLF and any other invasive species, whether they're a tree of heaven, um, if you have maple trees, pine trees, SLF lates, eggs on any of them. And this can be easier to do in the winter time when there aren't leaves obstructing your view. And I'll turn it back over to John with questions. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think in the interest of time, we just maybe have time for one. Um, and people are wondering if the removal of Tree of Heaven is advised. And I know that's kind of a tough question to answer uh, for a few reasons, but curious what your general thoughts are on that. Tom, do you have uh, an answer to that? I know it has changed in the past. Whether or not there, has, there has been some research, I think, out of Pennsylvania, or it could have been Rutgers out of New Jersey, I, I can't remember, um, that when cutting the trees, it basically it, it forces the spotted lanternfly to disperse. Um, also, one of the methods that had been being used were that the uh, tree of heaven um, are dioecious, uh, so they, they're male and female trees. So the, the female trees were being cut down. Um, and then a portion of the male trees were being left as trap trees. Um, so if that method is being used, um, if you remove all the trees, that kind of eliminates one of your, your, your you know, the tools in your arsenal. So, and they'll just move on to another host. They don't necessarily need tree of heaven. They can just find wild grape or maples or some other host. Mm -hmm. Great point. All right, um, so there's still a few more questions coming in, but I think that that will be it for now. Um, thanks so much, Michael and Tom. Um, maybe uh, stay tuned in the chat. Um, I may be sending you some additional questions, but at this point, I believe we're actually going to turn it over to Jennifer Dean from IMAP Invasives. Great, thanks. And thanks to Tom and Michael for such a great overview of Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven. And so now that we all know what to look for, we're going to trans uh, transition into learning about IMAP evasives and about the statewide survey grid. Next. But first I wanted to give you a quick introduction to the New York Natural Heritage Program, which is the organization that manages IMAP evasives for the state and also that Mitch, Meg, and myself and John all work for. So the Natural Heritage Program is a partnership between the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And it helps facilitate the conservation of our state's biodiversity by providing data and expertise on rare species, natural ecosystems, and the threats to each of these. And since invasive species are a major uh, threat to many of our state resources, the Invasive Species Database Program uh, manages data on invasives and provides data products that um, can be used by our state partners who are working on invasive species. Next. So we manage information on invasive species through a system called IMAP Invasives. This is an online mapping tool that serves as New York's uh, state centralized invasive species database. The system is freely available to resource professionals and to the public. And so, um, you know, many people can be signing on to this for different reasons. You can report locations, you can explore the maps, sign up for email alerts, along with many other features. Next. And there's three main types of data within IMAP invasives. Presence records indicate 
where you found something. So you can take a photo, mark a location on the ground or on the map, and that's where you found it. Uh, the not detected records are where you looked for something but did not find it. So this is that negative data that Tom had mentioned that's extremely valuable so we know where you've looked for spotted lanternfly and have not found it. And treatment records give detailed information about um, what you have treated in terms of invasive species. And this could be mechanical, chemical, or biological controls. But for today's purposes, we're focusing on those first two. Both the presence and the not detected records can be entered through the mobile app that Mitch is going to talk about here in just a little bit. And those reports go straight into the main online map. Next. Presence records can either be confirmed, meaning that the photo has been reviewed and an expert can um, deem that that identification of that species is correct, or they can be unconfirmed, which means that the record is still waiting confirmation, or it's possible that the photo is missing and we're not able to confirm that record. Next. And there are some special species that are so high priority that the records um, for those species are hidden um, from the public map. And so spotted lanternfly falls in this category. As reports come in, only cer certain state agency and PRISM staff can see this data. Um, this means that if you do uh, report a suspected spotted lanternfly, you will not actually be able to see your report after you submit it but please know that it is getting into the right hands. Next. Which leads to a very important part of IMAP invasives, the email alerts. So as reports come in, they go in first as unconfirmed, and then depending on the species, whether it's one of these um, very high priority species or more of a common species, such as um, Tree of Heaven, they get reviewed by different um, sets of experts. And then once a record has been set to confirm, then uh, that record becomes publicly available and user email alerts are sent out as well. Next. Except for these few <laughs> special species like the spotted lanternfly. So in this case, data from the public um, for spotted lanternfly is being channeled through IMAP invasives directly to um, New York State Ag markets. And they are the official keepers of the spotted lanternfly data. And um, so all the reports that you're putting into IMAP um, trigger email alerts that Tom and Michael will receive and other staff there. Um, so they can review that information, follow up if they need, it, need to, and um, put that into their own internal ag and markets database to be the official keepers of the spotted lanternfly data. All right, next. And with that, I will pass it on to Mitch. Thank you, Jen, and thanks everyone for uh, your overview so far. So I'm going to go through um, four steps on how to uh, survey for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven and report to IMAP invasives. I'm going to back up a little bit real quick. Um, so just to talk about where this is all coming from, where these steps come from. Um, so the motivation was that New York State needs to monitor spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven, and we need more eyes on the ground to do it. And we recognize that uh, people across the state know their areas best, so your local parks, your favorite trails, your backyard, um, and we need the distribution data in a centralized database. So the uh, resulting volunteer initiative that we've uh, been developing is getting a group of trained IMAP users across the state um, to survey for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven in, lo in their local areas and report findings to IMAP invasives. So we're hoping a lot of the people on the call today will join in this effort. So we're asking participants to claim a location to survey and then go and check for SLF and TOH uh, multiple times throughout the year at that location and then to report whether or not they found uh, Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lantern Fly using IMAP invasives, so reporting not detected and presence records. And so that's where these four steps come from. I'm going to walk through uh, one through three today, and I'll take a break after step two for questions, and then Jen will pick up step four, and you can get a, a review of all of these steps in detail at 
nyimapinvasive.org slash SLS. And as I dive into step one, which is uh, setting up an IMAP Invasive account, I just wanted to quickly clarify between the mobile app and the online web application. Um, so you can access the online web application on your phone. So if you're on your phone and you go to your browser and type in um, IMAP Invasive or nyimapinvasive.org or go straight to IMAP Invasive, um, that will be the online web application even if you're on your phone. The mobile app is something different. You have to download that separately. And uh, so I want to mention that there's these three recommended browsers that you should use when you uh, use the online database. And so I'm going to show you how to set up an account. Um, hold off on doing that right now. I've been told that we're having some technical difficulties with IMAP, uh, so that'll be back up soon. But for now, uh, I would not go to try to log in. But if you don't have an account yet after the webinar, you can go to the login button at the top right. You go to our website at nyimapinvasive.org, um, and there's a login button at the top right. There are also a lot of resources on the website that might be useful to you, but the main thing to point out right now is logging in. So that brings you to the create an account portal for IMAP Invasive. Um, and if you already have an account, you can just log in. Um, if you haven't signed in for a long time, uh, I guess since April 2019, uh, you probably have to reset your account. So there's that forgot password button if you can't get in. And if you don't have an account yet, you'd use the sign up box below. So you put in your name and email and set a password. Then it's very important to select your jurisdiction. This is where you will be collecting data. Uh, in most cases, it's where you live. It's the state or province. And for most people on this call, that will be New York State. So select New York, and then when you hit join, there will be a little box that tells you to uh, check your email. So make sure you go into your email and uh, follow the link to the user agreement. Um, you have to read the user agreement and accept it, and that's what activates your account. So only then can you go back and log in and uh, report records and everything. Um, so make sure you check your email, check your spam box, and your junk mail. Uh, sometimes it goes there. And if you are not receiving an email after a while, uh, you can let us know. And so once you sign up, you can log in at that top bar, and it brings you here. So this is what it looks like when you log in. There's typically a message here on uh, new recent updates. You can read that, and once you're up to date, um, you can use the database. So just to give a brief orientation, there's the main menu at the top left, navigation tools on the left-hand side, like uh, zooming in and out and searching a location, action tools at the top, and changing uh, which layers you're viewing here. So under layers on off, uh, you can, for instance, select from not detected treatments and presence records. I'm gonna focus on the main menu first. So if you select your account from the main menu, it brings you to your account page. And so on the top is some of your information. Um, one thing I'll point out is your person ID. This is your unique identifier in the IMAP Invasive system. And we're actually having you use your person ID when you sign up to claim a location, a survey for Spotted Lantern Fly and Tree of Heaven, which I'll explain later. And then below all that, there are boxes for projects and organizations. And so for most of you, or many of you, these might be blank. So organizations, those are more for people who are doing invasive species surveys and management as a part of job duties. Um, so they would be joining their employers uh, Organization. So if any if it applies to any of you, you can join your employer's organization. Um, and if the organization is not there and you think it should be an IMAP, you can email us and I'll have my email up on the slide soon. Um, typically citizen scientists and volunteers do not need to join organizations. They're not required to use IMAP invasive. 
And then there's another thing in IMAP called projects. These are another way to group data in an alternative to organizations. And these are great for people volunteering for an organization, for example. Um, these are also not required, um, but just something you should be aware of. And I wanted to give an FYI that we are creating a project um, in IMAP that we are going to uh, link your records to. So if you sign up for a location a survey for Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven, um, we'll have your person ID and we'll be able to associate your Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly records with a project. So if you um, do need to join an organization, uh, this is how you do it. So in, in your account page, there's an edit button on the top right. And so when you click that, you'll have an option to scroll down and request to join an organization. And you can type into this, once you hit that, you can type into the search for your organization and click request to join. And this workflow is the same for uh, joining a project, if you're ever asked to join a project. And once you uh, have selected your organizations or projects, if you have any, many of you will not need to do this, um, you press save at the top right, and then you will be a pending member of the organization until uh, your organization admin accepts you into the organization. And one last feature I wanted to mention were the email alerts. So Jen talked about these a little bit. Um, state officials use these to stay up to date on new observations, but also anyone can sign up for them to stay informed on species and geographic areas that we're interested in. So one example would be you could set up an alert for a Tree of Heaven records in a prism, in your prism or in your county. Um, and the way you do that is you go into email alerts from the main menu and there's an add edit alerts button and that allows you to opt in and out of some general alerts you can opt in or out of those, and you can also create custom alerts like confirmed tree of heaven in uh, capital region prism. And just to reiterate what Jen mentioned, um, you will be getting, you'll be able to set up alerts for confirmed records generally, and um, you will not be able to do so for a spotted lantern fly because it's one of those special hidden species. And all right, so that's step one. And I'll stop for some questions after I get through step two. Uh, you may have some questions on step one. But so step two is selecting a grid square. So this is, uh, we've talked about signing up for a location, a survey for spotted lantern fly and tree of heaven. So uh, some several state agencies and NYNHP have selected one kilometer grid squares across the state where volunteer survey efforts would be most helpful. Uh, to complement the statewide efforts already in place. And so there are a number of grid cells um, lit up across the state on a map interface that I will show you soon. And there are a couple of different colors so, um, which show how these different grid squares were selected. So there's the focus grid squares, and these are the, the most important ones. So these were selected, they were handpicked by Ag and Market staff and Park staff um, either areas where they're near a known infestation or public lands that are uh, developed and at high risk. And then, so those are the most important grid squares to sign up for, but uh, those are like the high priority places. And there are a lot of areas across the state where we also want surveys done. So we've opened up some more grid cells, which include blue grid, grid squares, which are blue grid squares, which uh, indicate that there is public land within there, usually state parks, and also purple grid squares, uh, which indicate that there is a confirmed location for a tree of heaven. So this uses um, data from IMAP invases. So those are areas where someone has submitted a record for tree of heaven and the record has been reviewed and confirmed. And I want to also mention that there is an alternative option. So I've gotten some questions um, from people who want to survey an area that's not within a grid square. And what we have to say for that is that any spotted lanternfly or tree of heaven survey effort is useful. 
and we'd be happy for you to still participate with this by surveying for these species um, just without claiming a grid square. So the purpose of the grid square is to focus the, the bulk of our volunteers into some key areas where we really need efforts the most, um, but we also appreciate efforts outside of these grid squares. And so now I will do a brief live demo to show you um, how to sign up for a grid square. And so you go to this website here, nyimapinvasives.org slash SLF. And so that brings you here, and there's a lot of information on this page. Um, there's some backgrounds at the top, and then below there are some more resources that might be of interest to you. So the step one through four that I'm going over right now are uh, explained in detail on here if you need a refresher. And we also have some resources that will help you identify and learn more about spotted lanternfly here. And there's also um, some information on how to connect with your prisms here. And uh, important info for anyone who wants to join this volunteer project. Um, so you may sign up for a grid square, but you need to think about where within that grid square you actually have safe, easy access to. Um, so just read through these uh, guidance notes and disclaimers if you're interested in participating. And then at the bottom is where the sign up map is hosted. So there's um, some uh, tips on how to use the map. I encourage you to look through those as you go in for the first time. I will just uh, go straight to launching the app here. So uh, click this launch sign up map. And um, I should clarify, I'm going to ask uh, for now, just watch uh, my screen um, rather than following along live. And then once I'm done with this live demo, you can go in and uh, use the sign up map. So I just want to, uh, if there's a lot of people clicking the same button at the exact same time, it might slow things down. So just to make sure that things are moving quickly, I'll ask you to just uh, watch for now. And so the map will load up in a new tab. And it will look like this. Uh, one of the first things, the two things you'll notice first probably are this find unclaimed grid squares near a location and also this map. And you might notice that the map has no grid squares on it. Um, and that's because it's very zoomed out. So to see those grid squares, you can, uh, those will appear once you're zoomed in a little bit. And uh, to go over some of the tools up here, I'll go over the basic ones first and the advanced ones later. So there's a legend. If you want to scroll through and figure out what everything is that you're looking at. Um, for instance, it goes through what all the different grid square colors mean. And then there's zooming in and out, plus and minus. And there's a home button that brings you back to that home view. And so one of the easiest ways to figure out what grid squares are open near you is to type in your town here. I'm gonna move my phone so you can't hear my typing. Okay. I'll type in Albany, New York, and it zooms in. And it actually um, will, will put here any of the grid squares that are within the radius that you've selected. Um, I think it's easier to just look around the map, but if you do want to use the results here, you can um, change the radius by sliding it, by sliding this bar. Um, so see, as I, as I scroll out, it starts to capture the nearby areas. But again, I think it's easier to just look around in the map. All right, so um, you can look around at the grid squares. Um, if you have any focus, grid squares, the orange one with the red outline. Um, those are the most important ones to sign up for, so I would recommend seeing if you're willing to survey any of those areas first. And then uh, 
going to the other areas too. And so I'll just sign up for uh, this purple area. And so you just click on a cell and then there's an option to claim this grid square. And so your IMAP person ID is what you enter. Um, and there are instructions in this link here. So I'll put my number in. If you need a review, and if you need a review, you can click that link. I'll just answer quickly just for time's sake. And then you can claim that grid square. And it tells you you've claimed it successfully. And when I go back to the map, it might take a little bit to load. So right now it doesn't say I've claimed it, but eventually it will look like one of these gray squares, which says it has been claimed. And to show you some of the more advanced tools on here, um, there is a option to switch your base map. Uh, for instance, you could choose the imagery hybrid so that you have satellite imagery and street names. Um, you can print a PDF of your map to save for later. You can see the grid square I just claimed turned gray. Um, so if you zoom in, you could uh, choose this print icon. And this will allow you to print a PDF. And there's also this layers on off. Um, most of you will not need to use this, but you can turn layers on and off here. And then finally, a really useful tool is this find my claimed grid squares. So say you want to figure out what you signed up for uh, a few weeks after you signed up and you don't remember. So you just type in your person ID here. I'll type in 1876 and then hit apply down here. And that will bring you to your uh, the cells you've signed up for. So since I signed up for two, it's kind of zoomed out. If you sign up for one, it'll zoom in right to one of them. So I signed up for this grid square up here, as well as this grid square down here. And that's all I wanted to show on that. And I think we have time for probably one question. Or we can just keep moving. I believe we are okay for now. Okay. And so step three is preparing for surveying in your own grid square. Uh, there are a couple of different tools, but we're going to focus on the mobile app for now. And it's important to figure this out before you go out and survey. And I want to emphasize where you can find help on the nymathemesis.org slash training. There's a self-guided training section, as well as on the SLS page, there's some resources. And one of the resources are these uh, video tutorials uh, that go through how to log in and sign up and get the app and get everything set up. And so you can use those to get trained on your own pace, because I'm going to run through things very quickly uh, shortly. And so I'll switch to the mobile app, which you download from the App Store or on Google Play. And the app has a workflow of basically three parts where you set up the account and the app when you have connection to internet or service, and then you record the species, um, perhaps not in connectivity, and then you get back into connectivity and upload the records to IMAP. So I'll start with setting up. So hopefully many of you have downloaded uh, the app. It should bring you to this screen if you open it for the first time. If not, you'll need to uh, go to the preferences by selecting it from the main menu at the top left-hand corner. And then the most important thing is to select preferences. Uh, so is to set these first three preferences. So your jurisdiction, you have to choose, and then your username and your password. And then you hit retrieve IMAP list. And if you get an error message here, um, try retyping. Um, 
even if you're sure that it's right, maybe just wait a couple of seconds and try again. And if you continue to have errors, you can let us know. And then the rest of the preferences are optional. One that I'll mention is that you can uh, set a customized species list with a short list of species that you're interested in. Um, but most of these defaults are optional and can be left as is. And it's important to save your preferences at the end. So that's how to set up. And then to record an observation, it's that green um, add observation button at the top right side. And you can, you can do this once you've successfully got that uh, retrieve IMAP list message. But the first thing you do is take a photo and you can choose whether or not you want the custom species list. You select the species. Um, for anyone following along right now, you can select fake species to submit a fake record, um, which will not affect the database, but it's a good way to check whether your app is working. And then you select detected or not detected, depending on whether you found it. And so I want to note that good photos are very important for confirming. So on the left-hand side, um, some botanists I'm sure can tell that that's Tree of Heaven, but others might have more difficulty. So it's really important that you take a picture that's both close up and in focus and uh, make sure it's a really high quality picture that it's easy to see what the species is. And then uh, you can check on the map that your location is working or check the bat long here to make sure that it's not a zero zero because then you might need to make sure your GPS is enabled. And then we're asking people to enter the approximate time they searched for an invasive here. And you can also add any comments that might enhance the report and make sure to save your changes. And then to upload the record, um, you'll notice that a yellow card appears on your screen. Um, you can edit that or you can just, uh, you can check that box if you're done because from the main menu, there's an option called Upload Selected. Um, so this is how you upload records once you're back in the office or back in connectivity. And uh, so once you click Upload Selected, you will get this message asking if you're sure you want to upload. And you can upload more than one. So there is this option to select all if you have 10 records. Um, we recommend uploading in batches of 25 or less if you have many records. And once you hit OK, um, the card will actually leave your screen and your screen will be blank. And that's actually a good thing. So if it's a yellow card, that means the record is on your device. It's not in the online database. Um, once it's green, that means the record has left your phone and it's now on the online database. And so that means you successfully use your connectivity to upload the record. And just to let you know, you can go on the online website to view that record. And I won't go into detail about that now, um, but you can use the filter tool to filter on a species, um, just an FYI that SLF is hidden to most viewers. And you can find help at those websites I mentioned before. And so now I'll turn it over to Jennifer Dean. Great, thanks Mitch. Now that you're all set up with the technical components of signing up for GRID and reporting your search efforts to IMAP, let's talk a little bit about the actual field work. So first and foremost, we want you to be safe. You know, always be mindful of traffic conditions, weather, which can turn on a dime here in New York. And you wanna make sure that your target spots within your GRID square are um, allowable for public access. And so, you know, you can start by selecting a grid in an area that you're familiar with and then study that map um, before you head out. And here on that, that map on the side, I have the satellite imagery on. And so Mitch did just show you how to turn on that satellite imagery on the, um, the grid squares. All right, and so then once you're out there, you know, definitely stay within your comfort level, um, but you can start surveying uh, for Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven. So start walking around. Um, you can, you know, perhaps target disturbed areas, but also look in natural areas as well. 
Um, look at flat, flat surfaces. Like Tom mentioned earlier, spotted lanternfly can lay its egg sacs on just about any flat surface, um, protected flat, flat surface, natural or man-made. And then if you think that you find something, um, use the IMAP, and mo IMAP Invasive mobile app. And so if, if you do think that you found either Tree of Heaven or Spotted Lanternfly, enter these as presence records. Um, reminder to take good photos, for sure. Um, if you think it's Spotted Lanternfly, you know, use your phone's camera to enter, or to take a lot of additional photos as well in case you need um, more photos to, to send later on. But if you searched and did not find anything, which is actually what we're hoping, <laughs> then you can enter the not detected records. So these are really valuable, and that's what, you know, we're hoping that you won't find the tree, uh, spotted lanternfly. Uh, so enter these as not detected records. Uh, please enter the number of minutes that you spent searching for each record. And we recommend about three to 10 minutes of searching at each spot within your grid. And we hope that you can revisit your grid every two to six months to look for the different life stages. And if it's possible, um, try to collect about 20 not detected and or presence records during this calendar year. So on that map that you see on the right, this is just an example um, I chose. It's a town park that I visit occasionally along the Mohawk River, uh, just north of Albany. And I know that the parking is right outside the target grid that, um, you know, that I selected. So that yellow star is where the parking lot is. But that's okay because I'm familiar with the site and I know I can safely walk into that grid square. I also know that there's a variety of areas to cover here. There's a lot of man-made structures around the swimming pool and around the park buildings. But there's also trails in the woods that are within my comfort level that I feel you know, comfortable serving. So let's say I start at the park buildings near the pool and then at one point I find a small clump of Tree of Heaven trees. So I'm gonna take out my phone I'm going to enter a presence point for Tree of Heaven, you know, taking good photo, of course. And then while I'm there, I'm going to spend the next five minutes searching those tree trunks for spotted lanternfly. You know, luckily I didn't find any, and so that means I can enter a not detected record at that same spot now for, for spotted lanternfly, um, taking, you know, probably taking a picture of the clean trunk of Tree of Heaven. And then I want to enter that time searched. So this is just general and, um, you know, overall, do what you can. Any search effort that you report is extremely valuable. Thanks. All right. This is Meg Wilkinson again. We've covered a lot of material. I'm going to do a couple of wrap-up slides, and then we'll shift gears to a pure question and answer. So uh, next, as we wrap up, Next slide, Mitch. Okay. Um, and we're doing the second poll that I promised that will be kind of now you've had a lot of information about um, Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven and IMAP Invasive. So I think this poll has four questions, so please be sure to scroll down and catch all of them. I'll do a couple slides and then we'll look at the results. Okay, several times we've mentioned um, an incredible network that we have in New York State, uh, Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. There are eight of them in the state. And uh, if you go to the New York IMAPinvasives.org webpage and go on the About tab and scroll down, there's an interactive map with clickable links for each of these. Um, they're incredible organizations. They each have their own list serve you can sign up for and you can find out about events and activities and invasive species in their, um, in your local area. Next, please. All right, I'm gonna share take home messages from each of our presenters. So from Tom Algeyer, Check flat surfaces that are protected from the elements. From Michael Giambalvo, check your trees. From Jennifer Dean, review your grid map before heading out for spots that are safely and publicly accessible. And from Mitchell O'Neill, submit and upload a fake species record before you go out in the field. 
And thank you again to all of our presenters. All right, so we want to thank you for taking your time on this webinar to learn about these, uh, the Spotted Lanternfly, the Tree of Heaven, and IMAP. And we hope that you are able to walk through all of today's objectives and that you are now ready for some detective work. All right, um, let's look. Did we give enough time for the poll? Can we do poll results? I see it yep. still has, yeah, okay. Thanks, Mitchell. I saw it, but it, it counts down first. I, did, I saw the countdown. I didn't know if we can shorten it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Is that a no, you can't shorten it? No, but now it's ended. Oh, okay. All right. Mitchell, can you read the questions? All I see is now that. <laughs> All right. Um, now that you've received some training, how comfortable are you searching for and identifying SLS and TOH? Excellent. Looks like most are moderately familiar. Okay. Good, good. You can keep going. I'll. Okay. And then, uh, how familiar are you with IMAP and BASIS now that you've received some training? Um, looks like there's all across the board. Um, most people are comfortable submitting data with the mobile app, so if they have an account. And then the third question do you plan to participate? Um, out of those who answered, most have say that they do plan to claim a risk very soon. And then it looks like most people do not need further assistance with IMAP and BASIS uh, for the Q&A section. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. All right. Well, that's wonderful. That's um, certainly a lot of information was absorbed. Um, we will cover more in the general Q&A and then we have a specific time set aside just for IMAP questions. And also, we did share our email address several times, and it is on our web page. So anytime you have a question, you're welcome to also reach out to us um, on our email account. All right, next. All right, so now we'll shift into the first part of the two-part question time. So this is um, general questions and SLF and TOH questions. And um, I think what we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll pause in about 10 minutes and shift to IMAP questions. Let's give a full 10 minutes. And at that shift, so that'll be like 2.35, at that shift, if you don't want to stay on for the extended IMAP time, um, please feel free to log off. Um, so John, I will open it up now for general questions and Spotted Lantern Fly and Tree of Heaven. Okay, excellent. Well, first of all, I uh, just want to thank everyone for submitting uh, questions. Uh, we had a very active chat uh, box and um, thank you for your patience with our virtual meeting setup. Um, for, for the next time, I think we're going to have a little bit better of a QA and a um, system, but I think this is this has worked pretty well. Um, so the number one question I actually think that has come up uh, in the chat box are concerns over um, spotted lantern fly data being hidden um, in IMAP. And some are curious why that is the case and also where uh, they might be able to find um, data that is available for spotted lantern fly um so that could question i guess could be for for everyone potentially this is tom um so some species invasive species like spotted lantern fly can have uh, very dramatic and severe regulatory concerns and and and, and financial issues um Say spotted lantern fly is reported in IMAP and everyone can see it, and it's right next to a nursery. Um, you know, people can blame that nursery for bringing it in when they have no 
responsibility whatsoever for it being there. And also, um, false reports can be put in for that sort of thing. Not that that would likely to be happening, but it could happen. And also, um, you know, once some other, somebody reports it, it's not, if it's not confirmed, uh, you know, it, it may just be one dead insect. It may be another insect. It may be uh, gypsy moth eggs. It may be something else. So we wouldn't want um, accidental misinformation being put out there until it's confirmed. Um, so there, there are regulatory, there are financial concerns that, you know, that could have dramatic negative impacts on, on businesses throughout New York state. Um, so that, those are some of the reasons why um, the spot and lantern fly data is, is not accessible um, publicly yet. Excellent. And I will note um, the one resource people may be interested in is through Northeast IPM. Um, they do have a regularly updated map of distribution of spotted lanternfly um, in case that's helpful for, for individuals here. Um, next one is about reporting not detected data, particularly for spotted lanternfly. Um, some people are interested, some people are curious um, how to best report with a photo that, for example, egg masses were not detected. Um, are there any, is there any guidance that, um, you know, those who, who will review those not detected records, what would you sort of look for in a photo like that? Well, I would think if it's negative, you know, if, if it wasn't detected, then a photo wouldn't be necessary. But if, a, if it is suspected that you found spotted lantern fly, then a photo would be helpful. So photos really wouldn't be useful for negative data. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. Um, next is regarding uh, survey effort within a grid square. There's a lot of different questions uh, about this topic. Um, some uh, people are wondering if there's a specific amount of time uh, that they should spend surveying the block. Um, and, you know, as well as when they resurvey, should they go back to the same areas uh, or sort of over the season, you know, go to different locations. Um, so curious if anyone has any general thoughts about how people um, should collect, you know, data in their grid square. This is Tom again. Um, so we've talked about this internally and basically our bottom line is that any survey is good surveying. So we wouldn't want to restrict people to only surveying a certain time or for a certain length of time. Uh, whatever they feel comfortable and and they're going to be aware of their surroundings if it's a if it's a lot that has you know i'm exaggerating but you know if it's a lot that has 3000 alanthus trees it's going to take a lot more than a lot that's mostly turf um yeah so or you know a paved parking lot something like that um so it's really variable so we wouldn't want to make recommendations for time limits or duration um it's just what you feel is adequate and and what you're comfortable with because you know many users are going to have different abilities. Mm -hmm. yep. Can I add into that? Because um, that was an excellent response, Tom. And we just would encourage people to you know just look at your watch when you start surveying, and then look at your watch when you're done, and record that time spent into the mobile app when you're recording the the data. Hopefully for the not detected records. And so you know once we look at that data, we'll have a much better estimate of overall across the you know the survey project um, how many hours were spent surveying perfect okay um there were a few additional spot lantern fly general questions i might just try to go through a few of these um some are wondering um the color is are the egg masses always gray and white in color um, as I mentioned a couple of times, they're, they're very variable in color. They can be white, almost white. They can be tan. They can be very dark brown. They can be uncovered completely. Uh, so that there's a lot of variability in the color, uh, but they're generally lighter, uh, uh, more uh, earth tones. You know, as you can see in the photo that's on the screen now, they're, it's almost white uh, when they're first laid, but then they, they kind of turn grayish, brownish. Um, it really depends on the, on, on the environment that they've been exposed to and how long they've been laid. So there, there is a great variability in color. Excellent. And um, 
Next, actually, is an interesting question. Um, can detector dogs be used to uh, detect egg masses and or insects? Has that been implemented at all in New York? One of the uh, participants would be better to answer that than I am would be Linda Rolleder. Uh, but yes, they have been used um, and we, we hope to use them more extensively. Great, great. Um, one of the questions I was curious if uh, egg masses do any damage to the host tree. Uh, that's still research that's being conducted. It would also depend on the on the age of the tree, what type of tree, the, the you know the, the level of infestation of spotted lanternfly. There are a lot of variables there. So, mm -hmm. but, um, there there has been such seen to cause uh, damage to fruit production and also uh, you know aborting fruit that's there and also changing the flavor of fruit uh, in grapes. So there 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 it definitely does affect the tree, and also it, it's outright killed grapevines. So. Um, you know, vines not being trees, but um, that's just one plant that's been studied a little bit more than others. Perfect. And um, another uh, interesting or another question was, um, you already sort of addressed how long, you know, the survey should take place. Um, someone was curious how soon they should start surveying um, for egg masses. Uh, the egg masses are the only, only life stage present right now. So whenever the surveyor feels comfortable and safe, that would be a good time. Um, their yep. egg masses are, or you know, you can find egg masses pretty much almost any time of the year. Um, July and August, or, or sorry, July, June and July, or you're not likely to find any egg masses. But the rest of the time of year, um, like right now. <laughs> Uh, you're very likely to find or possibly find egg masses. Um, we have another uh, person, uh, Matt Brinka uh, from New York State Parks, um, is mentioning about the effects of uh, spotted lanternfly uh, in terms of quality of life, in terms of encouraging people to look at videos of infestation. So i um, curious if anyone wants to talk about um, some of the other negative impacts of spotted lantern fly that you know that people could encounter as as if spotted lantern fly were to spread more. Um, I think I showed a, a few photos of it in my in my talk, but there were some some steps that were covered in in honeydew where mm -hmm. um, sooty mold had started to grow. Um, now, as I mentioned, you know, on a bright sunny day, they could be showering down this excrement, this honeydew, in vast quantities as if it was raining. So um, not something you're going to want to go have a picnic under, not mm -hmm. something you're going to want to go out and, and you know, and uh, recreate under. And also it could have impacts to recreational equipment. Um, you know, the, the honeydew will coat, the, you know, anything under it. So you have kayaks or, or ATVs or anything like that. And then this you know, sooty mold starts growing on that. I apologize for the background noise. Um, you know, the sooty mold can, can kind of coat and damage these, these uh, recreational items as well. And it kind of discourages, you know, it, it has a mental effect where people aren't going to want to go recreate if, if these things are present in the environment. Yep. Yep. Concerning. Yep. Concerning for sure. Um, one final question about tree of heaven, actually, um, and I, I believe what at least one person mentioned about, uh, the seed production from tree of heaven, that, which I know is a, a major concern. Um, so I'm wondering, Michael, Pascal, if you might be able to mention a little bit more about tree of heaven seeds in terms of someone who's curious how long they persist in the soil. Um, you know, you know, I know they also can generate many, many seeds. Um, so curious if you have any other. Thoughts on tree of heaven seed production. I don't know how long they can s survive in the soil seed bank, um, but they are winged samaras, so they get blown. They can travel far once uh, a wind catches them. Uh, one of the ways they spread so far already. The it's interesting. The roots of Tree of Heaven 
can actually change the soil nutrient cycling and the chemical composition of that soil to make it more hospitable for its offspring, its seeds. So the seeds might be more likely to grow where Tree of Heaven already is just due to that process. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. Um, and then actually along a similar line, I think sort of my final spot of lanternfly question is um, people are curious how far the nymphs and or adults can uh, travel um, and whether or not that is a factor in, you know, where people are kind of surveying and um, just general curiosity about how far uh, the insects can travel. I had mentioned in the chat, um, I, I think I responded to this question in the chat, but the, uh, the nymphs uh, won't travel very far on their own. I don't know the actual distance, you know, within feet or meters, but they will, uh, they have this uh, habit of climbing tall structures, whether it's trees or buildings or power transmission lines and kind of launching themselves off and being carried by the wind. So they use that as a dispersal method, so they can actually travel further than their their physical power can can, can transport them. So they have a, a little bit of a um, a behavior that can can spread them a little bit further than what they can carry themselves. Um, the adults are are fairly good flyers, um, but they're you know they're gonna they're gonna seek out food sources. So depending on where those food sources are depends on how far they fly. Great, perfect. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think one of my final questions is sort of for IMAP and uh, Ag and Markets both. Uh, some people are just a, a bit curious if they do make a report, if someone will follow up with them. Um, and um, so, you know, I think, and what they're wondering is, you know, will they get an alert if the if a record is confirmed? Um, so I think the response to that is sort of two part. Um, and, you know, first part is I, I, I just mentioned is that if you are submitting tree of heaven data and you want to know if those records are when they are confirmed, there's actually an email alert. Uh, you can sign up in your email alerts that will, um, alert you of that. Um, for spotted lantern fly, that may be a little bit of a different, uh, situation. So, um, curious if anyone wants to jump in on that. Jen might be able to better address that than I can, but I know from the, as far as the following up from the state agencies, yes, we would follow up as resources would allow. Um, if it's an area that's being reported where we already know it exists versus an area that we don't, um, our, our reaction is going to be very different. Um, you know, if we're overwhelmed with reports saying that there's spotted lantern fly in Staten Island and, you know, versus one that's, you know, in Montauk. You know, we would we would check the Montauk report first because it's a new area. Um, we might not uh, follow up on an area that we already know is positive, um, in the same same manner that we would in an area that we where we don't know it really exists. And, and Jen would know more about the uh, the the mechanics of of how they would be contacted. <laughs> Right, thanks, Tom. And yeah, so we leave it to Ag and Markets to decide on what needs to be followed up with in, in terms of, you know, sending boots on the ground. Um, and we do try to reach out to the uh, the observers to thank them for their their report. And you know, if it's incorrect, we'll let you know that we got it out off the map. And thank you for your um, your report. And then if it is correct as well. You know, we'll we'll reach out and, and let you know that ag markets may be contacting you. Great. And Jen, another question um, that, that we could probably answer as well is there were a few concerns regarding private property. Um, what is our general recommendation for um, individuals who are surveying for spot lantern fly and tree of heaven or any um, yeah. IMAP data? That's a great question. And we do have um, a, ter a data terms of use on IMAP invasives that it's not very long and it's not too much, you know, legalese in there. So it's actually easy to read and you can read through it and just see how the data is used, 
essentially, we, um, in that terms of use, it's, um, you're agreeing that you do have permission to collect data on whatever property that you're on. So you never, you know, we definitely discourage anyone from collecting on private property without permission from that landowner. And you have to be aware that the data that you enter is, is publicly available in IMAP Invasive. And so, you know, definitely bear that in mind. And if that, you know, affects your decision on how to report it, um, you know, if you see a spotted lantern fly across, <laughs> I don't know, you know, in somebody's private property, um, you can let them know to contact Ag and Markets because that's, you know, it's definitely a, a, a situation where if there's one bug spotted, there's probably more, um, you know, and it, it does not respect pro property boundaries. But definitely in terms of just the legal ease of um, collecting data on private property, um, you do need to make sure that you have permission from the landowner. And the, the grid squares that are available for, for being claimed, it's the public land that is available, not the entire grid square, but it's the public land within that square. Excellent. Yep. Great points, Jen and Tom. Um, so I think with that, it's already 2.45. Uh, <laughs> so I think that um, is pretty much the majority of the questions I've, I've seen regarding Surveying a spotted lantern fly tree of heaven. Um, again, thank you so much, everyone who submitted comments. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't quite get through each of them, but I tried to, you know, bring the themes of of the questions, and and pose them here. Um, Tom and Michael, if people have specific, more biology centric questions, should they send an email to spotted lantern fly at agriculture.ny.gov or is there another contact uh, that would be better? Uh, they can also email me. It's thomas.algeyer at agriculture.ny.gov. Great, thanks. And if you could put that in the chat box, uh, that'd be great as well. So um, I think Meg, at this point, if we want to, um, if, if you want to help move us into yeah. the final section. Sure. So um, one thing I'll note too, John, I sent you uh, in the chat, um, there is a wonderful article in Conservationist Magazine about the lower Hudson dogs that are used for invasive species detection work. So that PDF I shared, uh, if you want to share that with the group. And I see Tom put his email in the group in the chat box too. So. All right, so um, at this point, we will say again, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to people who attended. Please follow up. We do know IMAP did have issues today, as mentioned. Um, we are suspicious it's just pure volume, so please try again tomorrow. <laughs> I do see that there are a lot of people who are kind of in the limbo land where you've requested an account, but you have yet to click on the activation email. And so, um, Please look for that activation email later if you already signed up. Um, and if you cannot find it, let us know. You know, email us and we'll help set you straight. That's a great point. We can rescue people from that limbo <laughs> land. And also that email does sometimes get sent to your junk folder. So be sure to check there as well. All right, so at this point we'll um, conclude the formal webinar. Did I thank the participants? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, and then we'll shift gears. I believe we had about 15 people that were interested in staying on with some very specific IMAP questions. So um, thank you, and there's our email. And go ahead, Mitch, we'll switch to the next slide. And to kick the IMAP questions off, we um, did a poll just to help us pinpoint where most of the issues might be. So um, please, uh, it's one question, please let us know <laughs> how you're doing and then we'll um, begin discussion. John, did you have any questions from the chat that are IMAP specific that we might loop to to begin our discussion? Um. Not at this uh, moment, but I'm going to keep going through. There's still a few I haven't. Um, That's a lot. Actually, while, while we're waiting, um, 
There were a few questions, actually, one just came in about the um, certified trainers network and other questions just about interest, passing along this information to others. Um, so some may not be aware of the uh, certified trainers network, but I guess in general, we might just want to discuss um, for those who want to share this information with their own organization or others, um, you know, what what would the best method be to do so? Well, that's great. Mitchell, you want to take both of those, CTN and general IMAP? Sure. So the, the Certified Trainers Network is a group of uh, people across the state. Um, some are professionals, like maybe education and outreach staff for a PRISM or uh, some other nonprofit. Um, and it's people who conduct trainings on using IMAP and bases. So essentially, uh, my part of the presentation today where you learn how to set up an account and uh, use the app. Um, it's just people who train uh, different audiences on that. And so this can be useful to people who are looking for a trainer to train their group. So maybe a club they're involved with or an organization they're involved with. And it's also useful for people who are interested in conducting the trainings themselves. So there's a form that you can fill out to join the network and uh, learn more about how you can conduct trainings and help get the word of IMAP out there so that we have more eyes on the ground across the state. And then for general information on IMAP, I would say that the best place to go is nyimapinvasive.org. Um, so there's a lot of general information about IMAP there. So there's a about page and there's some information just on the, the home page as well. And for like specific questions that you you have, you can email us at the email on the slide and in the chat. Cool. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, I think we probably gave people enough time for that polling if you're Okay. Able to finish that? Yep. I pressed close, but then it, it does a mandatory 20 second countdown. So in a ah. couple seconds, it'll be close. Interesting. Okay. Five more seconds. Okay. And in the meantime, too, if, uh, there are several people on IC, and if you want to put your specific question in the chat box, we can work. Um, from that as well. Let's see. And I learned how to see this. So if I hover, it tells me what the rest of the question is. <laughs> so have you successfully? Uh, we have people about a quarter have logged in. So that means, well, many didn't finish, so um, didn't answer. So um, some have downloaded the app. Uh, Retrieved IMAP list, that's a great test because that means your username and your password on your phone match the username and the password online, which sometimes that's been a typo issue over the years. Um, and then created a record and upload and view online minimal. So A, B, and C got chunks, although not everyone, and D, E, F has fewer people. Um, oh, right, I can't see the chat, John, so did you get more? I keep looking in the chat to see if anyone added questions, but I can't see it. <laughs> um, a few um, specifics that I've sort of followed up with and some um, are following up in with our email address. Um, I will note that um, I believe if you had been trying to use IMAP um, and we're receiving an error message. Um, to my knowledge, it is working a bit better. So um, if that was the source of any issues for anyone, um, you may want to feel free to go ahead and try again, um, either confirming your account online or setting up that account um, or using the app to um, log in or upload records. So. Well, that's a good point. They wouldn't have been able to upload the, the, the IMAP did go down at least three times during our webinar. So um, 
they couldn't have possibly uploaded their from their phone to the server when it was down, right? Most likely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if that was an issue, certainly try that again now, uploading it while the machine is back. Um, great, okay. Do you, um, John, I, I put a chat to you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. No, I think we'll probably hold off on that. Okay, got it. Yeah. There are two uh, other quick questions, uh, a little less specific to IMAP, but would be good. Um, someone asked if there, you know, there, they mentioned there are no grid squares where they live. Um, but just as we've uh, mentioned before, um, you know, you can feel free to um, survey in areas um, that are not technically within your grid square. Um, you know, the grid squares are designed to help, you know, kind of, uh, you know, highlight potentially potential survey areas, but um, you're more than welcome to uh, collect data anywhere, um, even if not in a grid square. Um, and then the other uh, question was someone's concerned because they live in an area that um, has no cell service, can they still use the app? And um, for that, uh, the, the key is to um, get the app set up um, in an area where you have connectivity, such as at home. And then once the app is, is set up, um, you can actually go out in the field, um, even places without any cell service, and um, GPS will still work um, regardless of whether or not you have cell service. Um, so that that should help us there. And then then once you you know collect those records in the field, you would come back um, to an area with internet connectivity, um, and then at that point you you would be able to upload those records. So that, that's definitely a question we get very, very often, and hopefully that helps. And so, yeah, that's really the majority of the questions that I believe I've um, received. If, um, if others do have specific questions um, that I haven't addressed, feel free to enter them into the chat. Um, and you can also um, email us afterwards. Um, with, we have two two main things we always like to hear, which is what device you're using and uh, a brief description of what the issue is. And we can get back to you via email if you have like a specific issue that you can't get past. So uh, one person asked, "Can we explain the significance of?" fake species upload, or whether or not it has significance, I guess. <laughs> so fake species was basically just made so that we have something that we can use to test um, records with. So you can enter as many fake species records as you want just to test out the process without having to worry about submitting like faulty data. Um, so. Those records are removed from the database on an approximately weekly basis. So we just go in and get rid of all the fake species records regularly so that um, there's a way that you can practice submitting records without having to submit the real thing on your first try. So right, Mitchell, yeah. I'll records. just add to that. Um, so as I mentioned, a very common issue we run into is especially on iPhones, it tries to be helpful and it sometimes puts a space after you type in your username or your password on the iPhone in the preferences. And that space is considered a character and then it won't match when you go 
into you know, trying to upload it to your IMAP account because there's no space in your username on the IMAP online site. So by entering a fake species and making sure that it goes in okay, you know that you have your password right and your username right on your phone. And before we created the fake species, we had some really scary episodes with the email alert system where someone was just playing around and testing and they put in um, species that did trigger many email alerts. <laughs> so the fake species um, uh, don't trigger the email alerts the way other species do. So it's, it's just a testing purpose. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I really think that's that's the majority of the questions. You know, a few people here and there. We've actually got a number of people who said that by the end of this, they have now been able to go through the whole process. Um, you know, sign up for account and all the way through claiming a grid and a few other questions about, you know, putting in other records um, online. And um, as far as I can see, um, I think we're pretty much mostly caught up with everything. And I think at this point, most people would, um, might just right. email with any final questions. So, um, again, thanks to everyone who's still on who, um, there is many, many messages in our chat box. And so, um, I have tried to do the best I can to keep up and I think I, I did pretty well. So. John, you did great. Thank you. <laughs> and Thanks to everyone who stayed on. It is now three o'clock, which is when we promised we would end. And so um, I do hope if you are having any issues, please don't hesitate to reach out. We do try to troubleshoot and get everyone up and running, um, even with many different varieties of technology. Um, so I think that is wonderful and I think we'll wrap it up. So thanks to our presenters and our attendees and uh, good luck surveying and please don't hesitate to email us. Yeah. And there are many, I know not all the presenters probably can see, but there are many uh, kudos and thanks coming into the chat for the presenters. So uh, thank you everyone. All right, thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks everyone.